Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on calcium signaling. In this video, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at uh, the effect of calcium concentration going up in the cytosol on calcium concentration in the mitochondria. Because basically, what we're going to see is that when calcium goes up in the cytosol, it also causes a uh, rise in calcium concentration in the mitochondria, and uh, later we'll see what effect that might have. So, um, the topic for this video is calcium and signaling and the mitochondria, really. Calcium and the mitochondria. Right, so uh, here's the plan for what we're going to do. We're going to have a brief uh, reminder of some of the little microanatomy of mitochondria, and, um, and uh, yes, uh, and a few of their physiological properties, like the electrical potential difference across the inner mitochondrial membrane, things like that. Uh, then what we're going to look at is how calcium homeostasis is controlled uh, within mitochondria. And then we're going to look at the effect of calcium rising in the cytoplasm on calcium levels in the mitochondria. Okay, so... Let's begin with the mitochondria. So I will draw a picture of a mitochondria. So remember, mitochondria are double membranes. They have two membranes. And by this, I do not mean that, um, because, well, I, I just want to make something very clear. The, a membrane is often described as a phospholipid bilayer. So it's a two layers of phospholipids. Now, the mitochondria membrane is more than that. It is actually two membranes. So this is one membrane, and then you have another phospholipid bilayer, like so. Okay, so it is not just that uh, there is a space between the two layers of phospholipids. That is not it. There are two separate membranes, and then there is a space between them called the intermembrane space. Okay, so here is the outer mitochondrial membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer. So this is the outer mitochondrial membrane. Okay, and uh, there are evolutionary theories as to why the mitochondria has two membranes. The theories are that originally what happened is that the precursor to a eukaryotic cell basically phagocytosed another smaller cell. So let me show it over here. So um, if we have our precursor to a eukaryotic cell here, then basically the theory is that it might have phagocytosed a smaller cell like so. So what would have happened is that this would have gone into um, an endosome. So here's the um, endosome, or the phagosome, or whatever you want to call it. And then the smaller cell would be in there, and that's how it might have got two membranes. So here's the outer membrane from the endosome, and the inner membrane, which I haven't drawn yet, would be the original membrane of the smaller cell that was engulfed. Anyway, that's an evolutionary theory. Uh, so this is the outer mitochondrial membrane. Membrane. Okay, right. Uh, then what you have is another membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane, and it is sort of, uh, it's not a simple circular structure. It folds in, there are folds of this membrane inwards, and these folds of the membrane inwards are there to increase the surface area of the inner mitochondrial membrane, and they are called cristae. Okay, or a crista is the singular. So here's the inner mitochondrial membrane, so let me just mem... Uh, let me just label that up. So this is the inner mitochondrial membrane. Uh, so this is the membrane that is hypothesized to have come from that uh, smaller cell. And then this sort of space inside, which is called the matrix, would then, contra uh, would then be the cytoplasm of this smaller cell. So this, this is the inner mitochondria. How are we going to have space? Just a membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, and then this space inside the mitochondria, and I'm going to add some colour on here to make it look more interesting. So this space inside uh, the mitochondria, which would have been the cytoplasm of that cell that was phagocytosed, that is called the matrix. So this green space is the matrix. Okay, so this is the matrix. Matrix of the mitochondria. And these sort of indentations of the inner membrane inwards those are called cristae, or a singular is the crista. So this is a crista. Right, okay. Uh, now, another important space is this intermembrane space, which I will highlight in pink here. 
Okay, so on this picture, that will correspond to this space here between the two membranes, like so. Okay, so this is our intermembrane space. So I'll just finish this colouring in now. Uh, so there's our intermembrane space, all nicely coloured in, and I'll label it up. Right, so this is the intermembrane space. Right, and now we need to um, do a little bit of reminder of the uh, physiology of uh, the mitochondria, intermembrane space. Right, okay, so what, what happens across the mitochondria uh, in the membrane? What's something very, very important happens across the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is the respiratory chain happens along there, the electron transport chain, the proteins of the electron transport chain, complex one through complex four, they are in this inner mitochondrial membrane. And basically, what they do, we're not going to go into it in much detail, <laughs> I never plan on doing that again, but um, basically what they do is they pump protons, they use uh, the electrons that have high energy to, um, they use the energy from the electrons to pump protons from this matrix, this green space, into the inter my intermembrane space. So they pump protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So, that means that this matrix here becomes alkaline, so the proton concentration is low. That means that it out becomes alkaline, so its pH goes higher than 7. And the pH of the intermembrane space becomes acidic because you are adding protons in there. Also, protons have a positive charge. So, um, you are moving positive charge from the matrix into the intermembrane space. So, what's that going to do? That's going to make the intermembrane space positive, and it's going, to make the, um, it's going to make the matrix negative. So, if we ask what is the voltage difference, or the electrical potential difference, from uh, the intermembrane space, so I means intermembrane space, uh, to uh, the uh, matrix, so from the red uh, place to the green place. So imagine a little man sits in the uh, intermembrane space, measures the electrical potential there, then he moves into the matrix, <laughs> which sounds awful, but he moves into the matrix and uh, he um, then measures the electrical potential uh, there. And he wants to know how different is the electrical potential in the matrix from the electrical potential in the intracellular space. So what he would do is he would say, OK, here's the electrical potential in the matrix. And now what's the difference between that and the electrical potential in the intracellular space? Now, if this one's positive and this one's negative, then this overall number is going to end up negative. And the actual electrical potential difference is negative 160 millivolts, which is massive for physiological uh, circumstances. Uh, so basically, if you move from the pink to the green space, the amount of electrical potential you go down is 160 millivolts. You go down by 160 millivolts. That is a big electrical potential difference for physiology. Right. Another thing that's important to say is that this inner mitochondrial membrane, so this membrane here, this is extremely tight. It is not very permeable. It does not allow things to just pass through it. And that's very important because the protons need to remain uh, in the intermembrane space and they can only get have to be able to only get back into the matrix by going via the ATP synthase enzyme and then driving the synthesis of ATP. Um, uh, but the outer mitochondrial membrane is quite permeable. So this one is permeable. And uh, the intermembrane space, uh, sorry, the in inner mitochondrial membrane is quite tight. Now you might worry, what about these protons just diffusing off? If the outer mitochondrial membrane is not tight, why don't the protons just, you know, go through it and go into the cytoplasm? Well, basically all I should have to point at is this, minus 160 millivolts. These protons are trying to get back into that matrix. They would love to be uh, at that low electrical potential. So they are all being attracted, basically, to the matrix. So they are sitting on the outer aspect of the inner mitochondrial membrane, just trying to get through, but they can't. But they're, you know, they're very much so attracted there by the electrostatic interactions. 
All right, so I think that's all that we need to know about uh, mitochondria uh, anatomy and physiology for now. Uh, so uh, now let's discuss how calcium homeostasis occurs within uh, these uh, mitochondria. So I've just told you that the outer mitochondrial membrane is quite permeable. So calcium basically can freely diffuse, well, as far as we're concerned, it can freely diffuse across that outer mitochondrial membrane. So the important thing is controlling the movement of calcium across this tight membrane, across which calcium can't diffuse so easily. Right, so what you have is one protein which allows calcium in, and then you have one protein which removes calcium, basically. So firstly, let's think, what is the tendency of calcium going to be? If you've got some calcium in the intermitochondrial, sorry, the intermembrane space, this pink space, what's it going to want to do? Well, it's going to want to go into the matrix because the matrix is very, um, has a very low electrical potential relative to the out intermembrane space. So it's going to want to go in there. So basically, what you do is you put in a little, um, you put in a protein into the inner mitochondrial membrane. And this protein is basically a calcium channel. So I'm going to draw another picture of the mitochondria because that one's a bit crowded with all the colour. So let's have another picture of our mitochondria here. Okay, and you've got your inner mitochondrial membrane with the cristae. I won't draw too many because I could get carried away with this, but that'll do. Right. Okay, so uh, now let's draw a channel in here. So this is a channel, and this channel is called the mitochondrial calcium channel. So MCU for short. MCU, mitochondrial calcium. Oh, sorry, not mitochondrial calcium channel. Mitochondrial calcium uniporter. <laughs> MCU. Uh, right, okay, mitochondrial calcium uniporter, and that's actually very important. Uh, because it doesn't conduct calcium in an arbitrary direction. Mitochondrial calcium uniporter. It only conducts it in a single direction. It does not conduct calcium in the other direction. And the direction it conducts calcium is basically inwards. Now, this channel is not capable of transporting calcium against its electrochemical gradient. It can only transport calcium in the uh, if it's if that calcium is moving uh, down its electrochemical gradient, which in this case it nearly always will be because the electrical potential uh, difference across this membrane is 160 negative 160 millivolts, so the calcium is always going to be feeling that electrical pull into the matrix. So its electrochemical gradient is always going to be pulling it inwards. And this channel conducts it inwards. Now understand that it is no a channel rather than a pump. It can only move the calcium in one direction, but it can o will only move that calcium if the direction which it wants to move it is the direction uh, which the electrochemical gradient favours. It's not a pump. The difference between pumps and channels is that pumps can transport it against the electrochemical gradient, whereas channels cannot. But you can have channels which will, uh, will refuse to transport in uh, uh, in both directions and only transport it in one direction. One direction. Those are known as uniporters. So this mitochondrial calcium uniporter is an example of a uniporter. Uh, but it is a channel, so it fundamentally cannot actively transport things. It will only passively transport things. And if the electrochemical gradient is driving calcium in the direction that this channel allows calcium to move, then calcium will move through. If the electrochemical gradient was going the opposite way, i.e. it was trying to move calcium out, then the channel would not conduct. Okay, so it wouldn't continue to conduct calcium in the opposite direction, even if the electrochemical gradient was this way, basically. It's not a pump. Okay, right. So, uh, this is allowing calcium to enter the matrix. Uh, what we now need is some way uh, to get the calcium out of the matrix. And the way that you get calcium out of the matrix is that you have another protein, which I'll draw over here, which is the sodium calcium exchanger, which is a pump. It uses secondary active transport rather than the actual direct hydrolysis of ATP, but it is a pump because it's going to move it against 
its electrochemical gradient. So basically, this is the uh, sodium-calcium exchanger over here. So this is a uh, sodium, uh, well, NCX is the usual symbols to denote it, but that stands for sodium-calcium um, exchanger. And obviously, the reason you've got the N there is because sodium in the periodic table is denoted by Na. So the N is for that, sodium-calcium exchanger. And the X is for exchanger. Right. And basically, what this does is it will move free sodiums in to um, the matrix, which the sodium wants to do because, you know, it wants, it's a positively charged ion as well. It wants to be at that low electrical potential. And then you're going to move warm calcium out. So that's the way in which you control calcium uh, in the um, matrix of the mitochondria. You have one bringing it in and another throwing it back out. And they, at uh, cytosolic calcium levels, they will be nicely within equilibrium. Okay, right. So we'll continue our discussion in the next video.